Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Is Brand Loyalty Dead? Customer Retention in the Age of Distraction. My name is Chris Bechtel, and I am the VP of Growth and Marketing here at Annex Cloud, and I will be your host today. I began my career in e-commerce nearly about 20 years ago in women's apparel, back when people were still skeptical that people would buy things online, and especially clothing. So it's fascinating to see how things have changed, and I hope to share some of these insights with all of you. Um, I will be joined today by our featured speaker, Wayland Wong, who's the CEO of Marine Depot. Marine Depot is one of the world's top suppliers of marine and reef aquarium supplies. Marine Depot was included in the Inc. 500 list of fastest growing businesses in 2011, is a Google trusted store, a three-time top 500 internet retailer, and a five-time biz rate circle of excellence winner. We've got a fantastic agenda today. Um, a couple of housekeeping notes first up. We are recording this webinar, so we will be sure to send all of you a copy of the slides along with the recording so you can review anything that you might have missed, uh, share it with a colleague, um, review anything again. Um, we all also will have, as you notice here in the agenda, a Q&A at the end of the webinar. Um, you can submit questions directly via the chat on the left side of your window. Um, all of your chat questions will get sent directly to myself and Waylon. Um, so I will moderate as many of the questions as you can. So certainly uh, feel free to ask questions also during the presentation. We'll see if we, we can answer them as we go. Um, but we will have about 10 minutes at the end of the presentation today to answer many of your questions. Also, if you have any audio issues, I see as many of you are dialed in by phone, which is great. Sometimes um, you'll get a better audio quality by dialing in by phone. Um, if you need to switch, if you're dialed in uh, just using computer audio, um, you can choose on the upper middle section of your screen, switch to phone, and that will provide the phone number for you to dial in. If you're only dialed in by phone, maybe you're driving, um, you can also log into the presentation via any mobile device. Um, so you can follow along and see the slides um, if you're not able to see them now. Um, so we've got a great agenda today, as I mentioned. Uh, again, we're going to talk a little bit about some trends in loyalty, um, loyalty in practice, and we'll go through some things about how it works. So first up, a little just introduction and a brief uh, reminder to many of you, if you haven't um, come across Annex Cloud or don't know about us and what we do, Annex Cloud is a unified platform providing all customer loyalty, referral marketing, and user-generated content solutions in one powerful platform. We've powered more than 250 leading brands and retailers. Um, and we have some of these top brands. Um, this is just a sampling of a few. So first up, you know, here's some of the trends that kind of we're seeing here at Annex Cloud. And, you know, all of us as marketers and uh, e-commerce professionals, you know, we're highly aware of, you know, some of the challenges that we face. And here's sort of a recap of kind of what we see. And obviously due to a lot of, you know, socioeconomic factors, technology factors, you know, there's a lot of things impacting consumer behavior and content consumption. And these things, you know, are, in, are changing on a daily basis, frankly. Um, and that's really affected, you know, consumer attention and brand affinity. Um, we were having an internal discussion here at Annex Cloud briefly, um, you know, in the last week, really about uh, brands and how people used to buy logos. And, you know, but today with the evolving, depending on who your market is and who your market segment is, um, but, you know, there's a lot of changes. Certainly the millennials are more focused on experiences today, which is why customer experience and brand experience has become more important than ever, as opposed to the desire to have a logo. Um, we also see because of the, the massive levels of distribution, um, there's highly competitive discounting because we're all trying to get you know, drive sales, right? And so certainly because as we use, you know, um, direct to consumer channels and we use digital channels for acquisition, um, you know, we often are faced with trying to drive sales and using discounting, which we could have a whole another webinar around discounting 
um, and how it, you know it can be kind of an addictive drug where once you start discounting, it becomes very difficult to get off of that as you tend to train many of your customers to buy only when there are sales. But we're doing everything we can to kind of you know raise attention and drive revenue, right? Um, the other challenges, of course, is the proliferation of you know new and smaller brands that are entering the market. You know the Shopify ecosystem makes it super easy for people to have you know new online stores. Um, there's a lot of pure play e-commerce providers or brands that are just launching and growing, and so there's so much noise in the marketplace that it makes differentiation a bit of an obstacle. And clearly, you know, brick and mortar has been suffering. So see, these are some of the current challenges. I also see that the cost of attention continues to rise. And so those of you, um, probably most of you that have digital ad spend, um, especially social ad spend, this is a chart actually, you know, going back to television advertising, the cost um, you know, per impression. Um, but this is certainly, I've seen, I've seen this in Facebook as well. Obviously, we um, there's still limited ad space. Um, so inventory is low and it makes, you know, cost per impression much higher. So the cost of attention is rising. So that's one of the current challenges that's impacting all of us. I also see some of the Amazonization and I can't believe I actually said that word correctly. Um, uh, but it means it's more difficult than ever to profit from physical goods, right? I mean, here's a, just a, one example of, a, um, you know, in golf apparel where Amazon's, you know, own products compete directly with, against Nike and they're providing them at a lower price, right? Um, I'm sure many of you have potentially direct-to-consumer um, stores within Amazon and are trying to figure out how does Amazon impact your um your strategy overall. Um, and I'll talk to you a little bit about Annex Cloud does have some solutions to, to, to engage and retain customers that are buying on Amazon. And we'll talk to you about that in a little bit upcoming. Um, but this is one of the, the big factors that's, that's affecting where we are. Also, I see trust in institutions is declining, right? We all kind of probably intuitively know that by some of the major media coverage, but these are institutions from government, media, business, and NGOs. And it also, so what it means to us is that some of our digital media channel, channels, people have less trust. Obviously, people do tend to feel skeptical about straight, straight ahead advertising, which is why influencer marketing has become more effective, um, user-generated content. Um, because people have less and less trust in advertising and less and less trust in brands and businesses. So we need to do more to build that trust. But these are some of the factors at play that are impacting retention and loyalty. The other thing that we see is this is a, a Forrester report about predictions for 2018. And I thought this was particularly interesting about customer experience. So Forrester is sort of reporting that 30% of companies will see further declines in customer experience quality. So this means their customers will be rating their customer experience as you know, moderate and quality, which means that we've sort of plateaued. We've done a number of things to try and improve customer experience, but it's reached sort of a plateau. And, you know, it looks like a number of brands, or at least our customers are feeling that we've plateaued and have not done sort of gone the extra mile. So it's really indicating that we kind of need to take our customer experience to the next level. And that means customer experience across multiple touch points, every touch point, right? Um, you know, if we talk about brand loyalty, in many cases now there are so many more channels and so many more touch points in which we have to provide a quality customer experience, really, and delight these customers in multiple touch points in order to, you know, to drive loyalty. And ultimately, this this reckoning, um, poor customer experience will ultimately cause, in many cases, loss in, in growth, um, which can have a significant impact, obviously, on the bottom line. So the other thing that it seems is that Forrester reports that about 72% of retailers are working on personalization. And many of you have probably heard some of these things. Maybe you're already working on this. Um, you would like to do more of it. Maybe if you had more resources, you're looking at some of your providers, your vendors, um, to be able to provide a deeper level of personalization. Um, we, as Annex Cloud, have um, integrated and are partnered with all of the top 
ESPs, for example, from Bronto to eMarsis to ListTrack, um, to name a few. And all of them, in many cases, are working on, as well as Annex Cloud, a deeper levels of personalization. Um, and I'll talk about that, you know, coming up. Um, you know, AI is playing a big factor. Um, but obviously, all of us are looking to better uh, personalize our incentives and our offers. Um, and the technology is starting to make that more and more possible. Um, but these are things that is certainly something that, that is going to impact um, brand loyalty and retention and make a meaningful impact to your core KPIs, such as average order value, such as repeat purchase rates, um, such as conversions on those emails and other at touch points. Um, Another factor that I found interesting, and this is from Google's consumer predictions and mostly relate, of course, related to search. But as we, we've all seen, you know, our customers are more and more empowered, what we're calling the super empowered consumer, because they have so much access to data, but they still will ask more and more questions. Um, as many of you know, SEO, you know, search is you know, a high intent channel because people have a need, otherwise they wouldn't be searching, right? Um, and often they are looking for answers to questions. And so they're gonna want more detailed questions. They're gonna want, they're gonna ask more detailed questions and want more personally relevant answers. And they'll want it all much faster than before. Their expectations are much higher. Um, this screenshot here is an example of one of our clients, Murad, and their questions and answers function. And this is one of the core features of our platform um, that's available to, to as an add-on to loyalty um, or as a standalone. And one of the critical components of questions and answers, of course, is both um, you know, allowing customers and incentivizing them to ask questions as well as answer questions. Um, we also enable our customers, of course, to promptly respond to questions that get asked from their customers. Um, which which is super important, of course, for customer experience. We don't want any question to go unanswered. And we want those answers to be meaningful and add value, um, you know, and to be personally relevant, right? So this is one of the big trends that I see for 2018. Also, consumers, and again, Google is showing in its data, um, their head of ads research and insights, Sarah Kleinberg, you know, reports that consumers are really looking for ideas. And we've known this in many ways, right? Uh, many of you may be using Pinterest, for example. Uh, many of you may be exploring with, you know, user generated content. Um, this is an example of Bed Bath & Beyond is one of our customers um, and their user generated content. Um, section of their website where you can clearly see here people that are actual customers have submitted an actual photo of their living room and showing you know because there's how they you know actually are using this product the rug that they purchased from Bed Bath & Beyond. Um, so this gives not only other customers ideas of how they can use these products within their own home but also it gives some some credible credible third-party endorsement, right? It's user, it's real people, right? I think we all know that we tend to trust, going back to the trust barometer, we tend to trust our peers and other people like us more than we do, you know, any other source. So, you know, hence the trend with user-generated content. Um, and at Annex Cloud, we find that user-generated content tends to drive conversions, improvements in conversion rates. Um, because obviously people that come to um, this page, they find a product, they see how others are using it, they see a review on that product, it gives them some trust, um, levels of confidence, and so therefore they're more likely to convert and actually purchase this product right here. Um, so we allow our customers to upload, you know, have their customers upload photos. And then ultimately, how does this all tie back to loyalty? Well, we can then reward, and we'll be talking about this shortly um, with Wayland, and I'll show you some other examples as well, about how we can incentivize. And ultimately, what we're talking about is guiding customer behavior through incentivizing the actions that we want them to take. 
And in this case, we want them to upload photos, give us a good review so that other, other customers can discover this content and get some good ideas. So with that, I wanted to segue into introducing our featured speaker for today, uh, which is Wayland Wong, who's the CEO of Marine Depot. So thanks for joining us today, Wayland. Hi, how are you? Great. Well, thanks so much for joining us. And again, everyone who's listening, uh, feel free to you know ask us questions. We will be getting to as many of your questions as we can during the Q and A here shortly. Uh, but first up, Waylon, you know maybe tell us a little bit about Marine Depot. You know your role there and some of your current goals. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. absolutely. Um, Marine, Marine Depot. Depot. Hang on a sec. I'm getting an echo. Um, yeah, it's probably from me. Have to go on mute. Yeah, it's, all, yeah. it's probably from me, actually. So I'm just going to turn down my volume. But uh, yeah, go ahead there. Okay. Sorry about that. Yeah, uh, Marine Depot is uh, um, a saltwater aquarium store. Uh, we are only online. Uh, we used to have a catalog, but now we're only online. We've been around for about 20 years, which is uh, pretty ancient in the e-commerce world. Uh, we exist to uh, help saltwater aquarium enthusiasts, uh, hobbyists that have reef aquariums, saltwater aquariums, and we help them set it up with advice, support, guidance, and obviously we're there to sell them equipment. Um, our goal is uh, listed there is uh, really to you know, reduce the cost of acquisition. As Chris had shown earlier, it's just costing more and more to get in front of a customer and to uh, get them to reorder again. Um, we have the typical goals of any uh, really e-tailer, which is to reduce our marketing costs, increase our return on advertising spend. Um, and we do that through making our customer happy and uh, enjoying, ensuring uh, success and joy in their journey with us and in the hobby. And I, you know, and so, which is fascinating, obviously, I think you, you pick, pick out some great words, which is joy, right? And I think, you know, uh, like, how have you seen customer behavior change sort of in this, you know, in your last 19 years of, you know, being in business, you know, what, what are you, some of your observations based on kind of what you've seen and how you've seen people evolve in their behavior? Yeah, their, their behavior is, uh, has, <laughs> their expectations has continued to increase over time. Um, you know, there was a time when just shipping an order the same day was huge. Uh, <laughs> believe it or not, when we started 20 years ago, just shipping an order the same day was great customer service. Nowadays, if the customer doesn't get that order, get it in two or three days, um, they're pretty upset. And uh, you know, you mentioned it earlier that the 800-pound gorilla that really influences a lot of our customer expectations is Amazon. Uh, you know, we all know they don't just sell books anymore. Um, they've we've seen them over the last two decades slowly inch themselves into our niche, uh, which we thought was protected for a bit, but it's not. Uh, and so we've 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 struggled, and uh, we've we're you know we we just finding ways to differentiate ourselves from Amazon and even from our competitors. And so it's it's definitely changed. Uh, their expectations are higher, and uh, it takes more dollars now to get in front of them um, than it did in the past. Uh, the market's bigger, the online market's bigger, so it, that certainly helps that whole that whole formula as well. Yeah. And so obviously, what then, you know, have you seen has been effective in engaging and retaining customers? It sounds like number one, like a lot about the brand is really about delighting customers and bringing joy, um, you know, to them. You know, what what are some of the, the programs or little things that maybe you feel that you guys have done that's been effective in that area? Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, top of our list. To, to retain our customer and to, to give them joy is to have our operations down. You know, that's just basic, um, but it has to be said, right? Uh, we have to provide a good experience for the customer. Um, when they're on our site, things have to be intuitive. Things have to be quick and fast uh, when they're surfing our site. Um, I mentioned earlier, uh, it, it, shipping an order the same day and getting an accurate order um, and, and then having the customer contact us uh, when they need to contact us those are foundational, Those are foundational. Um, and, uh, and uh, having a rewards having program, a program helps, helps. but it's, it, having a loyalty program helps. But it, if if those other basics aren't in place, um, you know, the, it's 
rewards program isn't going to be that great. And so the foundational element, yeah, for us to be effective as Marine Depot is to first um, have our operations down. And so uh, when we added Annex Cloud, it was a time when we felt our operations were um, pretty solid. And, uh, and Alex has helped us with the retention piece, but I would say it wouldn't have been that helpful <laughs> had it not been for the operational piece first. Yeah, it makes sense. And would it be fair to say, um, here's a screenshot of the rewards program. We'll talk a little bit more in a second about it. Would it be fair to say that, you know, part of the motivation was that you felt like you invested a bit in retention, like operationally, and then, you know, you were looking for a rewards program to ultimately, you know, uh, protect that investment, so to speak, and ensure that you took that, you, you maintained that retention of that audience that you'd built, right? And and helped yeah, then yeah. improve it, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we felt that we had the basis down, and so we wanted to take the next step um, to really uh, you know, retain more of those customers and, and see what more we can do with the existing customers. And we've all heard that, you know, your, your, your best customers, your existing customer, not a future prospect out there. Um, and so we felt that we were at the, you know, the time was right for us to look into a rewards program. Absolutely. Right. And obviously, we, and we'll talk in a second about some of the metrics, but for everyone listening, ultimately, uh, you know, tell us a little bit about how the rewards program works. So it's clearly it's a tiered loyalty program where ultimately we're rewarding people and there's obviously dollar amounts and then we're rewarding people for taking certain actions here. Right. Um, it, can you tell us a little bit about sort of how the, the process went and, you know, how you guys ended up with some of these incentives and, you know, what, what some of the levels are here and, and why we kind of designed it in that way? Yeah. Uh, well, uh, we, we took a look at the existing rewards programs out there and uh, and we compared them. And, and so we said, okay, well, we wanted certain features and we, we had certain things we wanted to accomplish. We wanted to incentivize reviews. We wanted to incentivize um, you know, signing up for a newsletter. And uh, so we had certain ideas of what we wanted to do. Then we worked with our account manager and, and talked to him about best practices um, and some things that uh, we thought were a good idea, you know, didn't end up to be a good idea to to him in terms of best practices and some of them we just needed to test. Um, and so we, we looked at the existing landscape and uh, and compared it with sort of our, our goals uh, and then came up with a program that uh, felt match that. Um, and so it, it was you know, it was a number of factors, talking to our rep, looking at the existing landscape, and then also making sure it was aligned with what we want to incentivize and, you know, uh, yeah. So we, we, for example, we, we wanted our house brand to be uh, a higher point value than other brands. Um, and so we, we, we changed certain things. And so interestingly, like in looking at the numbers, right, so it looks like, uh, so ultimately what we're doing is we're rewarding actions that we want people to take. And I think back to the top of the conversation about you already had a pretty loyal customer base, but tell us a little bit about what, what some of the impact was, you know, after you had implemented the program here. Yeah, um, we, uh there, there is you know, these metrics here were actually a bit of a surprise to us. Um, we felt that we already had a pretty loyal audience. Um, most of our customers, about 65 of our cus 65 percent of our customers are returning customers, uh, and so we didn't feel like we were had a disloyal audience. Um, but what was surprising is that when we added the loyalty program, what it did to those customers. Um, and, it, and example one is that the, the average order value of a loyalty member was. Uh, a, a good percentage higher than our non-loyalty members. Um, that we didn't expect that, but that was a nice, pleasant surprise. Um, we also noticed that uh, folks that were loyalty members uh, ordered more, or more often, I should say. Um, not only were they ordering more, but they were ordering more often. Um, so there's a stat there. Um, they went from two and a half. It went, it went up to two and a half times from about 1.4 times per year, which uh, was a pleasant surprise. We didn't expect that. Um, Another thing that we didn't expect uh, that isn't a part of the retention metrics is, uh, <laughs> this may sound terrible, but um, many of our uh, folks uh, weren't redeeming the rewards uh, in a sense that they were using the reward program, but 
uh, on any given order, only about 25% of the folks with re uh, reward points were actually using them. And so, uh, you know, the way we saw that is um, they they might have been incentivized to order with us, but uh, using rewards and, and earning rewards, but um, only a small portion of it, you know, from an operational point perspective and cost perspective, were actually being redeemed. So that was an interesting surprise as well. Yeah, and so it's almost like ultimately people were taking the actions that you wanted them to take um, because they were incentivized. So in some cases, it's it's not necessarily about the monetary value as much as it is, as it is sort of the the nudge and, and maybe almost the gamification component, right? Where people want to accumulate points, but maybe they're less concerned about cashing in those points than they are just sort of the idea of accumulating points and uh, through, through some of these actions, right? It, it does seem that way, yeah. I mean, I, I guess the same logic has been used by the airline industry for <laughs> decades now with their miles program. So uh, it's, it's good to see it play out with our customer base as well. Yeah. And so, so for those people that are kind of like, again, you know, our audience is, you know, joined we're, that we're talking about, you know, is loyalty dead, uh, you know, uh, you know, how do we handle, you know, retention in this age of distraction, I guess, just, you know, one thought on, you know, for, for, for others that may be listening and kind of maybe considering a, a program, you know, what else can they do for, you know, to drive retention? Any, you know, just in preliminary thoughts on what you might recommend to them about how to approach something? Yeah, you know, it's it's differentiating yourself from uh, Amazon, right? And, uh, you know, we, we've found that being, a, uh, being an expert in our field, um, is what's going to change us, right? You can go to Amazon and order a part, and boom, you get it in two, three days. Um, you come to us, and we hold your hand through it, and you know, we're a niche industry, so uh, there's a lot of, uh, or I should say we're a high-maintenance kind of, uh, uh, I say niche industry where um, you, you can't just order a part. You want to make sure you have the right one for your setup, um, and that uh, you know, when you're setting it up, it's not just a, a very simple procedure. We're there to help you. Uh, and that's not something you can get from you know, really some of our competitors as well. So uh, dif differentiating ourselves that way um, has helped us quite a bit, and uh, as well as uh, you know, some of our competitors don't have a rewards program, and so that helps them stay loyal to us. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, those, those are the main things I would say. Is just <laughs> providing good service, um, providing an incentive. Uh, and uh, and providing a good experience operationally, getting getting a product that's accurate and good and, and quickly to them. Yeah, fantastic. So, and obviously, everyone will have a couple more minutes at the end of the presentation here to get some more um, insight from Wayland. Um, so, this is great. I super appreciate your insight here, Wayland. And um, so, now I'm going to kind of transition into a few more. Um, details and recommendations based on this to kind of carry the conversation forward. Um, so here's a couple of more recommendations, like ultimately to kind of take this to the next step. Like what we're really talking about here is combating distraction with loyalty. Um, and, you know, so what we've seen from Wayland is to use a well-designed tiered loyalty program to engage and then incentivize the behavior that you want them to take. Right. Um, so these are sort of the couple of clear recommendations and ultimately then to create some compelling rewards and perks that, uh, you know, ultimately feel um, aspirational, that feel interesting. And then this, the third thing is to really use segmentation to personalize those offers and incentives. Um, and now, as I mentioned before, Annex Cloud and can do in its platform the ability to segment and create specific offers um, you know, based on those segments, as well as, you know, our partners um, provide those abilities to be able to segment your audience and your data through your ESP and send them personalized offers. So one of the other recommendations that we see is a, is a big trend for 2018 to really combat, um, you know, distraction and drive loyalty is, is consumers prefer surprises to rewards. So this might be something worth testing. This is an example from Ikea. 
Um, but you might be able to like actually unlock a reward or unlock a surprise reward, right? So again, maybe to, to Whalen's point, it's less about the monetary value of something and more about the excitement of it, the gain of it to keep people engaged, right? So be creative and, and consider what types of surprises, because again, as I mentioned before, depending on your you know, target market, of course, the, the millennial generation is getting larger and more and more economic buying power. Um, and that generation is much more interested in purchasing experiences. Um, so surprises as opposed to monetary rewards may be something um, more of interest. Uh, we've also are seeing a big trend in premium loyalty programs. So these are paid. This is an example of Golf Now, one of our customers. Um, they have a VIP program that you can become a paid member of and you get exclusive benefits. So again, this is sort of ideally targeting a specific segment of their customer base, looking to retain them. So we can support an Annex Cloud, a paid member, a paid loyalty program. So people can enter and they get all sorts of rewards um, for being a member of that program. And you can also continue to incentivize and give them further rewards once they are a member of that program. So that might be something you want to kind of consider depending on um, what is appropriate and what your per current goals are. So some other best practices. So again, reward shoppers for taking the actions you want them to take. So again, maybe get clear on where do you need, um, you know, what actions do you need people to take? Do you need more ratings or reviews? Do you want people to comment or share in social media? Right. Um, do you want, obviously we're talking about going beyond points for purchase. Right. So we're, we're, we're looking at what other actions are meaningful and that are going to make a larger impact. Um, so you can then use these tiers to effectively incentivize that behavior. You also, depending on what channels, if you are a manufacturer um, and you have only manufacturer loyalty, um, that's something Annex Clouds can support. If you have actual brick and mortar stores, um, we can support that as well. So you want to ultimately unify loyalty across your channels and as well with Amazon. Um, so if you have a direct consumer channel or you're selling goods in Amazon, one of the ways is you can use um, a receipt data aggregator. And I'll show you a screenshot of that shortly um, so that you can actually recapture those people that have purchased products on Amazon. So what we're really talking about, again, is guiding customer behavior. Um, with social and behavioral loyalty. So going beyond just points for purchase. So here's another example of um, an Annex Cloud customer, Brahman. They have beautiful handbags and they have a whole tiered loyalty program. Might be a little bit hard to see in the screenshot, um, but I would encourage all of you to go to their website. Of course, go to Marine Depot's website, um, take a look at how their program works. But you can see Brahman you know, rewards um, not only points for purchase, but also social and behavioral actions. And the more actions you take, the higher tier you're going to get into, which provides you with more perks. So again, consider what type of social and behavioral actions you want people to take and, and work to incentivize those through re rewards. Um, so again, here's just sort of an example of some of the things that can be done. And again, through an omni-channel experience, so if you have stores, you can unify this experience and provide um, this both in-store as well as online. So even just checking in um, can be a reward. Right. Just visit can be a reward. So a whole number of things we can provide you with rewards. So here's an example of a receipt, what we call the receipt data aggregator, which is not a super, um, you know, but it's very clear what the product does. Ultimately, receipt data aggregator means if you purchase something at Amazon or at, if you're a manufacturer and you distribute products through other um, retailers, and you want to retain those customers in a loyalty program, you can capture their information by encouraging customers to then, if they purchase something on Amazon, for example, to take a picture of that receipt and then submit that to the loyalty program and they get points. So that's one way that at Annex Cloud we're helping you um, maintain a connection 
because and a relationship. And that's really, I think, the cause for concern, right, is if we use Amazon effectively, more than half of, of searches for products end up starting on Amazon. But if people end up do purchasing or discovering you through Amazon, ideally, you know, once they go back to your site and learn that they can get points um, for purchases on Amazon, they may do so. And so you can then still then try and recapture them and bring them back to purchase on your site, right, where the margin may be even greater, where you have a bit more control over the relationship on a one to one basis. Right. So. This is something to consider. Here's some other examples of other um, components of a program. You can give a discount when a friend makes a purchase. So a refer a friend program can also be rewarded, right? Or a rating or review can be rewarded, right? For providing feedback. Um, you can measure all of this impact, a net ROI, so you can start to see the increase in a referral program through new email addresses. Um, you can see rewards redeemed. You can see total revenue. You can see what conversion, how it's impacted your conversion rates. So all of these things, so you can start to measure, because ultimately a lot of this is really about testing, as Wayland had mentioned. Um, so we want to like we have some hypotheses, you know, as a head of growth, I constantly are coming up with hypotheses around what do I think is really going to drive the action that I want people to take, create an incentive, test a program and look at the impact. And then ultimately from there, I can improve and optimize. So we have a whole plethora of dashboards so that you can see sort of what the impact is of your program. So in summary. Ultimately, to guide customer behavior in this age of distraction, really what we've been talking about is keeping loyalty alive. So it's not dead. It's just evolved. And it's evolved because, as Wayland said, customers have much higher expectations. And so how can we deliver compelling um, programs that will you know, increase um, their engagement with us and deliver delightful customer experiences. So what we're talking about is ultimately engaging them through a customized tiered loyalty program, using compelling rewards and offers and surprises and testing those. Um, I also see the uh, emergence of AI and predictive analytics to pinpoint key segments. And that's something that we're doing at Annex Cloud. Um, is the movement, and we are seeing that across our partner ecosystem. Um, we are, again, partnered with all of the top ESPs as well as the top e-commerce platforms um, and others that are all looking and expanding their capabilities in AI and predictive analytics. And I think all of you are probably seeing this already, but this is where I see a big opportunity in the ability for AI to identify and predictive analytics to identify some segments in our data that reveal either customers that are needing attention or customers that are our best customers. So then ultimately we can structure incentives, offers, and rewards, you know, specifically to those segments. Um, then, of course, as, as Waylon was talking about, is really looking to elevate your customer experience. And I'm sure all of you um, are working in organizations that are looking to do this, you know, across channels. Um, to make customers feel really appreciated. And again, I think um, with segmentation, we can do this to with now personalization. So the more that we have the ability to segment, the more that we can personalize our communications to them. And again, Annex Cloud can support this through, you know, our tiered loyalty programs, very personalized and targeted offers and rewards. And finally, as I mentioned, really it's about this process of deploy, measure, optimize. That's really what this is about. And many of you may have heard this term sort of growth hacking. You know, um, that's sort of the big sort of buzzword in the world of startups is the idea of sort of trying to hack growth. But ultimately, there is no silver bullet in all of this. It's really about the secret to success is really about continuous testing. And there's a lot of data to support that. Um, and there's so that's really the best practice here is to I think as Wayland had mentioned in their development of a loyalty program, you know they 
built the program based on best practices. Um, they had some hypotheses. They rolled out the program. They did some testing. And ultimately, it's interesting to see what the result is um, in terms of increases in average order value, increases in repeat purchase rates. And now we have the ability to you know, test some different types of rewards, potentially, and incentivize different types of actions. Um, so now I'd like to kind of move into Q&A. Um, I know that's been a lot. We've been talking for a bit here. I want to give all of you attendees a chance to kind of ask us some questions. Um, so if you have some questions, please do feel free to submit them here via the chat. Again, we are recording the webinar, so we'd be sure to share slides with all of you along with this recording so you can get as many um, of these you know, questions answered, and you can review some of the answers. Um, so first up, uh, bring Waylon back on with us. Um, we've got a question here. Whoops, I went ahead one too many slides. So, you know, I guess, um, Wayland, even just from your observation, just, just as a, you know, uh, e-commerce expert, you've been doing this a, a while and looking at others out there, you, you know, do you see any any thoughts around mistakes you've seen that maybe other brands make with their loyalty programs? Anything that you might you see that people can improve upon? Mistakes. Oh, gosh. Uh, I have not thought about that, honestly. Mistakes that others have, have done. Um, yeah, let me think about that. I, I'm i going to try to reach back and think of mistakes we've done, but um, <laughs> not that we're mistake-free, but... Uh, I, nothing comes immediate to, to mind. Um, I mean, I guess here's the other way to frame yeah. the question. Do you feel that like if you guys had just just rolled out a program that was just strictly points for purchases, right? Do you feel like that maybe, you know, would it have been as effective if it was just, just straight like, oh, we'll give you a few points for some purchases? Um, you know, do you think that would be, you know, would it have been as effective as, as you think it is now? Yeah, I, I would certainly agree with that statement. That it, it it's just because it doesn't dif when you do something that really looks like everyone else, it doesn't differentiate yourself. Um, and so, uh, it, it yeah, I, I'd say uh, you know make sure how you give rewards aligns with your goals. Uh, I mentioned earlier that hey, if we wanted more reviews, then we're gonna incentivize reviews. Um, if we wanted more um, user generated content, like upload a picture or um, you know, whatever video, then then incentivize that and that being your goal. And you know, we there was probably some ways where we uh, averted disaster because we would run by uh, our account manager our ideas, right? And he and he would tell us we've done that. That doesn't work. Uh, or um, you can certainly test that. And but you know, from my experience of working with different accounts, he would tell us that. It, it was not a good thing. Um, so we probably averted some disaster from doing that, uh, but we're not totally certain because we just, we just, um, yeah, I mean, we just kind of went with his experience as opposed to, you know, making a big, big, bad mistake. <laughs> right. So certainly, right. you know, right. finding ways that are different and, instead of just, yeah, just slamming points and um, and expecting people just to, to follow you just because you give them points. That's, that's, not that interesting right and so so probably the answer to the question is like what kind of mistakes have people made it's ultimately about you know not differentiating themselves enough potentially and not really you know having a real substantive program that is going to truly drive the the you know the actions that you want people to take um let's see so we got another question around any recommendations around experiential rewards um, for loyalty programs. Um, when I think that's sort of a, you know, an interesting question, I think that's probably ultimately, I would start all about, to me, all, it's all about the audience. I think, you know, again, I've been doing this 20 years in marketing. And to me, even though we have all of this technology, to me, I think everything still comes back to people. Right. And I think almost all of our choices in terms of value propositions, in terms of the channels we use to reach people, in terms of then, you know, the rewards that we might use to drive their actions, it ultimately comes back to knowing who 
right? So I think that, you know, in structuring experiential rewards, which I think could be super interesting, you know, again, I think it goes back to who is your core audience and within that audience, who are the people that you want to incentivize with and what is the experiential reward that's going to most resonate with them and also potentially something that can continue to add value to you as a brand, right? I, I would think that, let's say I was strategizing uh, an experiential reward um, for Marine Depot with Whalen. Perhaps it's something that, because again, these are people that are, you know, aquarium um, aficionados, right? These are people that are passionate. And so maybe an experiential reward could be, you know, a variety of things, right? Um, that would delight them. Maybe it's a behind the scenes, maybe it's a shopping spree, maybe it's, uh, maybe it's an expert. Maybe I would want to uh, be paired up with an expert in salt water, Right. And, you know, what do you think, Wayland? Like if you guys and obviously we were just talking about this just the other day. So you probably haven't had a whole lot of time to think about experiential rewards. And I don't know how many of you guys. But if you were, what, what any thoughts on, you know, what kinds of experiential rewards you might want to come up with for Marine Depot? Yeah, I, I honestly haven't thought about that um, in terms of an experiential reward. <laughs> so I, I don't know. I don't have an answer to that question. Uh, I'm I'm still struggling with the definition of what what is an experiential reward. Is is that uh, something that's not point related? Is that what they what you mean? Yeah, and I think yeah, exactly. Something that somebody could experience, I suppose, right? Like so. Ultimately, I guess you would get points. How it can work is you get points, and you know you accumulate enough points, you unlock a reward. But right now, you know our our reward tiers at Marine Depot, right, are monetary, right? So you get you get coupons, right? But then maybe instead oh, sure. you could okay. either redeem that for an experiential reward that, again, maybe that's sort of, a, like I said, a an experience, right? So maybe it's an actual experience yeah. where they get invited to go to, um, you know, uh, somebody that's a saltwater aquarium expert and learn all about, you know, um, you know, some of the latest technology, maybe they get to go to one of your product manufacturers, uh, actual factory and see some of the latest technology and, um, you know, in aquariums or that kind of thing, something that would be like super cool that they could experience. Yeah. we. And what I think would be interesting, then they get some content, right. Um, which could be sort of use. you know, you get a whole bunch of content out of that experience and, you know, there's something to promote, right. So I think maybe that would be some sort of there's th those are my thoughts. Um, yeah, we haven't uh, utilized any of that. I mean, I, I, we've I think some of those have been presented to us by our account manager. We just uh, haven't come around to it. <laughs> we're busy with some of the other programs we're trying to manage with uh, Anis Cloud. So um, yeah, yeah. We, it's a cool yeah. idea, and it would differentiate ourselves um, with some. Yeah, those are those are great ideas. Um, but uh, we just haven't come around to it. So, um, and you know, obviously, I, and that's I, I, one of the challenges I'm sure for for most people, it's about resources, right? As I, I say, you know, ideas are easy. Execution is not not always easy, right? So I think, like anything, yeah. it's like prioritizing ideas that you know are the ones that are going to make the most amount of impact. Um, and this could be one of them. So for those of you listening, this might be something that you want to think about in your 2018 plan. How do you come up with an experiential reward and test its impact? Um, another question here is about how loyalty and referral programs can work together. Um, so again, I think one of the benefits, you know, without, you know, selling Annex Cloud too much, but one of the benefits of the, our platform is that, you know, these are three core features and solution areas that are tied together where, you know, being user generated content solutions, which are Q and a, um, you know, ratings and reviews, shoppable, Instagram, visual commerce, referral marketing. So it's refer a friend, um, you know, those types of programs as well as loyalty. And ultimately what we can do at Annex cloud and what, what, how I would recommend, um, you know, anybody dealing with a referral program is ultimately to make a referral program work, you really need to incentivize that action. And so certainly you can give, you know, referrers a reward for um, when their friends redeem. Um, but you can also, you know, provide loyalty points for just the act of sharing, 
right? Um, so ultimately, to make that referral program more impactful, which we see referral programs ultimately drive the metric of acquisition, right? Because referring a friend, like we talked about before, um, most of us as consumers tend to trust our peers more than we do advertising. So, of course, you know, hearing from influencers or our peers in a referral um, is a great customer acquisition strategy because it's a lower cost of acquisition, right? Because ultimately we'd have to pay, um, you know, high um, you know, advertising cost in order to acquire those customers. They tend to be better converting customers because they were referred by a friend. So they have a natural bit of trust. So their conversion rates are going to be a bit higher. So they're, clearly there's a lot of benefits in um, referral programs. And the referral programs can be even more powerful if you add the incentives that uh, a tiered loyalty program can provide. Um, and, you know, similarly, I think as Wayland had suggested, they'd already had, you know, somewhat of, you know, a fairly loyal customer base, but they then use the program to, um, you know, further retain that audience and actually make it even more um, impactful, right? Increasing the average order value and the repeat purchase rate from an already um, pretty loyal customer base. So it's, it's pretty interesting there. Um, so uh, I see, let's see, one other couple, we have time for a couple more questions. Um, so another question uh, here is, you know, influencer marketing really seems to be a big trend these days. Um, and so one of the ways to get attention of customers by, uh, let's see, are more distracted by the oversaturation and more cynical about traditional marketing. So how do you see that working within a loyalty program? So what we're talking about is sort of influencer marketing. Um, and influencer marketing, obviously, probably many of you have you know, heard this term and are probably practicing it to one degree or another. And, you know, influencer marketing can be sort of driven in a couple of ways, right? Ultimately, we're talking about, you know, Instagram influencers who have, you know, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, if not a million followers. Um, so there's those types of influencers, what I would call the macro influencers, and many of those, you know, are paid influencers and can be quite expensive, right, as some of you might know. Um, but then there's what I would call micro influencers, those that, you know, have great connections to their network of friends. I'm sure we all know one or two people in our circle of friends that have more influence than others. They tend to share content. Um, and there's a whole psychology around sharing, right? Because there's a huge psychology around the sharing that it makes us feel good by sharing for one reason or another. And often it is ego driven, the sharing. Um, so I think that ultimately how the question is, how do I see uh, influencer marketing with the loyalty program? I think it's ultimately, again, incentivizing um, those actions. Um, so that we can then incentivize, I think, those micro influencers um, to take those actions and, you know, incentivizing those micro influencers to share um, content, to share things, to comment, um, to provide a rating or review. So I think that's ultimately the benefit of tying influencer marketing to a loyalty program because we can then, again, with a loyalty program that's not just points for purchase, but it's actually rewarding actions. And again, maybe using rewards that are compelling and interesting, um, we can then make that influencer marketing program that much more successful, which again, to the point here, influencers can tend to you know, uh, as many of us now know, we can tune out brands that we don't want to hear from. Email is getting harder and harder to make an impact, right? Um, we can tune out ads and block them. But our friends or those that we feel are influential will still follow them on Instagram. We still pay attention to their Facebook posts. Facebook now is, of course, prioritizing, or at least they say they're prioritizing, um, comments from our friends or those that we're most engaged with. So the algorithms, even in Instagram, 
Um, all the algorithms are looking to show us content from those that we are consuming and engaging with most, i.e. influencers. So therefore, um, there can be a tremendous benefit there and an influencer program and a loyalty program can support that. Um, so I hope that answers the question. Um, I don't know if you have any comments on that, Wayland. Um, but I don't want to steal any thunder there, but any thoughts on, you know, just from your POV, um, you know, about how influencers, you know, how important are influencers today, um, you know, from your point of view? Yeah, I, I uh, would, say, would say it depends on the industry and niche, right? Um, for what we're in, uh, it's it's extremely important. Uh, people rely on forums and uh, boards and blogs and um, you know certain personalities on YouTube, uh, and so it's it's very important in our just because as you mentioned in your presentation, there's a distrust of uh, <laughs> corporations and uh, you know everyone with a any sort of monetary um, angle, right? And so um, influence are more and more uh, powerful. We haven't used um, rewards in con conjunction with with influencer marketing, unfortunately. So we we haven't explored that ourselves, but we know the power of it, and we've experienced the power of it. So uh, I I agree, it's something that really needs to be looked at for sure. Terrific. Well, so I, we looks like we've uh, kind of reached the end of our time for today. Um, so I want to thank you, Waylon, for taking the time out of your busy schedule to provide us with some insight um, and from your perspective. And I want to encourage everyone that's listening to certainly um, reach out if you have any more specific questions about um, what we've talked about today. Um, you know, Annex Cloud, we have a huge amount of resources on our website. Um, we have a very, you know, as Waylon mentioned, a customer success team that is, you know, very passionate about our customer success and has a huge amount of knowledge that we've seen across customers of different types. Um, there's a lot of different industries, of course, um, product categories. But just again, typically how we work, all of it is about configuring solutions that meet your specific goals. So it's not a one size fits all approach. We really work with people about your goals um, and design a strategy and a plan to meet those goals. Um, so we have this fantastic team, as I mentioned, and that's so you're really not just like, oh, here's here's a solution you know, make it work on your own. It's really a partnership day to day. And you can kind of hear that, um, you know, from what Wayland had talked about on an ongoing basis, we're involved in supporting your success. So again, uh, thank you all for attending today. Um, appreciate time. Look forward to um, an email with a follow-up in the recording and a link to the presentation. And I look forward to seeing you all again on our next webinar. Thanks again, Wayland. Thanks, everybody.